and I'm glad to be able to share with you the government's proposed recovery program, and we call it the Philippines Program for Recovery with Equity and Solidarity, or Philippines Progresso. And the whole idea of this program is we try to turn the crisis into an opportunity. And this is a draft that I present to you and would uh, look forward to hearing your suggestions, your point of view on how to make this uh, recovery program uh, responsive to the needs of the people. So what I intend to do in this uh, presentation would be first to give you an overview followed by a discussion on where we are now and I will focus first on the real economy and that means GDP, income and jobs. Then I will uh, show you where we are on the fiscal position on revenues, expenditure and deficit. And finally, I will show you the survey results uh, summary where we ask thousands of consumers, micro, small and medium enterprises and farmers. After I have laid out the context, I will propose to you what we are thinking in terms of the economic recovery program. And there are two areas on the expenditure side. It is called Bayanihan 2 that we are proposing to Congress. And in the tax incentive side, it is the CREATE or the Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentives for Enterprises Act. Now, uh, before I start, I want to propose uh, two things, uh, two principles in economics that uh, I suggest you memorize, you dream about, and you apply. And uh, most of you are students, and you probably have taken some economics in high school or in college. The first principle is nothing is free from heaven. Nowadays, and even before the crisis, Many people come to the government asking for subsidies, freebies, allowances, incentives, and exemptions. Uh, the truth is, uh, all the money that we provide for senior citizens, people with disability, the cooperatives, the re renewable energy, the farmers, the indigenous people, the BPOs, are all not free from heaven. Um, the government is simply a pass-through institution. We rely on an equitable tax system to provide redistribution for these grants, subsidies, freebies, allowances, and incentives to targeted groups. So during the crisis, when someone asks the government for support, this is not free. We are getting them from the hard-earned taxes of your parents, your friends, and our countrymen. Or if we cannot, then we borrow from uh, creditors, but this is simply postponing the tax. And we are basically asking our children and grandchildren to pay for irresponsibility that we don't want to face today. So that is the first principle. Nothing is free from heaven. The second principle that I want to share is everything is a trade-off. The, the purified water, the uh, clean air, the budget of your family, the budget of the government, are all finite resources. So they can be used, but if you use it for a certain group or a certain sector, what that means is another group is not going to benefit from it. So in the policy making that we do, we have to weigh the trade-off. We have to calculate the cost and benefit of everything we do. And examples that I will explain later are the decision to put the country, or Luzon in particular, under an enhanced community quarantine. Uh, another example is how we allocate resources in the national government's budget. Who gets what and how much? And the third may be, you can simply appreciate this with your own allowance. Should you spend your allowance, maybe 100 a day, for food or you keep it for an insurance policy that you might want to buy, or you want to keep it for a travel or a movie date or so on. So these are the two principles that I want you, hopefully, to memorize, dream about, and apply. And everything else in my PowerPoint and in life in general is about understanding these two basic economic principles. So now, let me proceed with the uh, proposed phased and adaptive recovery program. 
um, there are actually three stages. The first is the emergency stage. The second is the recovery stage. And the third is the uh, resiliency stage. Uh, we have actually started with the emergency stage. It is from March to May 2020. The analogy here is that the patient called the Philippines is in the ICU and is being intubated. And the law that is uh, basically helping revive the country is Bayanihan to Heal as One, or I call it Bayanihan One. And it addresses pillar one and pillar two of our economic program. And I will explain what that means. And under the Bayanihan Act to Heal as One, we have budget and procurement flexibility, subsidy to the poor and low income, where we gave 18 million poor and low income families, five to 8,000 pesos per month to help them uh, during the time when they are out of work because most of the low income and informal sector workers are under the no work, no pay uh, scheme. We also provided 3.4 million workers in small businesses wage subsidy equivalent also from five to 8,000 pesos per month. Uh, this is to help them cope as their employers are unable to operate and make revenues to pay them. We also supported key sectors like agriculture and OFW. We are also putting a lot of money in the healthcare system and supporting our frontliners. And uh, this uh, Bayanihan one actually expires in June. And we are now in the process of dialoguing with Congress to prepare the recovery stage. And this will cover the period June to December. And the analogy here is that the Philippines, the patient has now moved from the ICU to the regular room where he is now in, uh, in, a, in, in dextrose uh, mode. And the uh, two laws that we are proposing for Congress to consider are Bayanihan 2 and CREATE, and I will explain that later. And that addresses Pillar 3 and Pillar 4. Again, I will explain what they mean later. Now, what we are proposing is to continue the budget and procurement flexibility so that we are able to respond more adequately to the needs of the people. We will begin to uh, we will continue rather to reprioritize the 2020 budget towards the most urgent areas like health. We will resume priority BBB or build, build, build projects. On the demand side, the focus is to raise income and create jobs. And we can do this, for instance, by improving and uh, the targeting and implementation of Bayanihan One programs, in particular, the wage subsidies and the social amelioration as needed alongside job creation. And we will also, uh, on the supply side, support firms by providing liquidity and equity and also guarantees through the financial sector. And let's not forget, we have so many ways to help the economy and the people. And the budget is only one aspect. We can use monetary and financial sector policies to also help the people. And finally, we have targeted tax incentives, which I'll explain later. In the coming months, we will be preparing the 2021 budget and the 2022 budget. And together with all other reforms, we are going to prepare the country for a greater uh, stage of resiliency. And the analogy here is the patient called the Philippines has gone home and requires vitamins to continue to be stronger. And we will continue under this resiliency stage to reprioritize the 2021 and 2022 budget, we will do many structural reforms so that we turn this crisis into an opportunity. And we will also use the uh, opportunity to support the Balik Provincia Bagong Pag-asa program. And many of you come from the provinces, you are in the city studying, and we would like to see one day a more balanced development of the entire country. So this is, in a nutshell, the proposed recovery program that we are now in discussion with Congress. And you are actually uh, uh, in a prime position because you are seeing this uh, preview uh, earlier than many people. So now let me go to the overview. We entered, as Secretary Dominguez mentioned, the Philippines with, uh, in 2020 with one of the strongest growth uh, prospects. Uh, we are building on past reforms and solid macroeconomic management to deliver better. And we do not claim that we did it all ourselves. This is a building up and building upon the very good work of previous governments. 
in 2016 to 2019, we are among the fastest growing economies in the region at 6.6% average annual growth, despite the trade war and headwinds and other problems that have brought the global economy to a slower growth level. Uh, we are likely to become upper middle income country in 2020 before the COVID crisis hit us with per capita GDP of 3,512. We have very low and stable inflation. The average is 3%, well within the target of the central bank. Because of our build, build, build program, which reached a trillion pesos in the last uh, few years total, we were able to see the lowest rates of unemployment, underemployment, and poverty. We have a very strong fiscal position because we have used the opportunity to reform the tax system to become simpler, fair, and more efficient. Our revenue is 16.1% of GDP and is the highest in 1997. Our debt to GDP ratio is at the lowest, 39.6%, the lowest since 1986 and probably the entire history because we started accounting for this in 1986. We have very high international reserves. $89 billion in the central bank, and that can pay almost eight months of imports. We also have a BBB plus credit rating, or one notch below the A rating. Many of you are students, but when you graduate, you probably will one day want to own a car or buy your own house, and the banks will rate you and determine if you are able to pay back the loan that you took. If you get a high credit rating, you probably will be given a very low interest rate because the bank believes in you that you have been paying your credit card bills, you don't have uh, other uh, issues with the bank, and you seem to be very honest and hardworking. And that is also the same for the Philippines. If we have a very good credit rating at BBB+, plus, one notch below the A rating, uh, that means uh, for every 1 trillion pesos, for instance, of borrowing at 1% lower interest rate due to the good credit rating, we are saving actually 10 billion pesos per year. So instead of using that money to pay our debt, we can use that money to pay for other important services or subsidies to provide to the poorest people. Now, the problem is if we do not have a good credit rating, or for instance, you don't pay your credit card bills, you took a loan and never paid it, and you try to get another loan from the bank, the bank will see you as risky and will charge you double the interest rate in some cases. Um, so that is really what good credit rating means. And we are using this at this very important time, this crisis, to make our economy uh, recover. So this is where we started 2020. And the reason why we are able to do this is because we have been uh, doing a lot of the foundational reforms. We have a conservative and responsible fiscal management in the last many years. We have been able to do tax reform. We passed with Congress four tax laws, train law, the alcohol excise, the tobacco excise, and the tax amnesty for uh, delinquent accounts and for estate. And we have three more packages to go. The income uh, Corporate Income Tax and Incentives Reform Act, the property valuation, and the passive income and, and financial intermediary. We also did a lot of structural reforms, rise tarification, ease of doing business, national ID, universal health care, and universal access to tertiary education that many of you are, are benefiting today. And for the first time, we are able to spend more than 5% of GDP in infrastructure. And what that means is we are spending close to a trillion peso as of last year in infrastructure, total, national and local government. And that is uh, very important because 20 years ago, we have been told by World Bank and other important agencies around the world that for us to transform the economy and grow into middle income status, we have to spend on infrastructure. At that time, we only spent less than 2% of GDP or 100 billion. Today, we are spending 5% of GDP, and that is 10 times more or close to 1 trillion peso. So this very good foundation is what we are using during this very rain, rainy day. Uh, we did not anticipate at all that we would be facing three unexpected shocks of increasing magnitude in 2020. In January, Taal volcano erupted. And, and affected an area that is 50% of the country's gross domestic product. 
Then we saw a decline in tourism due to the global pandemic, also a decline in trade, uh, starting February, mostly from China. And in March, April, and May, we took the difficult decision to prioritize saving lives by imposing the enhanced community quarantine. And this is where we are right now, in a very difficult situation, like every other country in the world, but we have one of the best foundations to recover uh, in a very uh, more accelerated pace. Um, there are many people who say that uh, uh, there are many cases uh, or trajectory for our economic growth. Uh, it's hard to put an estimate, but let me share with you what these people have said. Some people say our recovery will be a V-shape, meaning we can recover starting July. So from a high growth rate of 6% last year, we will see negative growth before we see positive growth in the last two quarters. Uh, that would be the best or ideal scenario. But uh, some people say that our growth could be W-shape, meaning we recover, but we are not careful, and there's a second wave of the infection, and we will slump again before we recover. So that looks like a W-shape. And finally, a long U-shape or a valley, where the recovery will be many quarters or even a year until we find a vaccine. But my take on this is we can actually proactively use policies to achieve a V-shaped recovery. The virus containment policy, where we have imposed ECQ, the GCQ, and the minimum health standards. Uh, fiscal policy, as I've explained a while ago, to support the people and the business. Uh, monetary and financial sector regulatory relief to provide liquidity to the banks and built-in flexibility in the budget uh, that we are preparing in case of a W or a long U, all of these together with structural reforms are actually very important in shaping proactively our recovery. And this is easier if everyone cooperates, if all of you stay home instead of going out so that we can contain the virus quicker and open up the economy. We don't want to be in a situation like the Spanish flu uh, where uh, it, we, we saw a recovery and then it came back. So this is the uh, deaths per 1,000 persons in the UK uh, in 1918 and 1919. So after World War I, uh, there was the Spanish flu. By the way, we, we shouldn't call it Spanish flu. We call it the flu pandemic because uh, it's not fair to call it because it didn't really originate from Spain. But uh, the lesson here is that we don't really know what will happen. So we have to anticipate and be ready and be careful and be prudent. Otherwise, we would see some recovery followed by a spike again. And we'd, we'd, we wouldn't want that because that will erode very much the gains that we have had uh, since March. Uh, to address the uh, virus, we have proposed in the economic team a four pillar strategy where pillar one is really supporting the poor people so they will not go hungry. And we have put 589.97 billion uh, in the form of wage subsidy and social amelioration and many other smaller programs. In pillar two, we put 58.55 billion to improve the healthcare and help our frontliners succeed. In pillar three, we have raised 843 billion proactively at very low interest rates so that we are ready to fund pillar four or the economic recovery program. And that is what I will focus on today. So where are we now? Uh, clearly, our macroeconomic and fiscal framework has deteriorated, but fundamentals are very strong. Last year, GDP growth was 6%. In March, because of the Taal volcano eruption, the pandemic, which brought down trade and tourism, as well as our imposition of ECQ, we in the government projected flat to negative 0.8 growth. This has worsened uh, in the last uh, two months, and we are now projecting a contraction of minus 2 to minus 3.4. Our nominal GDP has also gone down to 19.3 trillion. Our revenue to GDP from the high of 16.8% is now down to 13.6 because uh, we aren't really collecting taxes. There is no business during the ECQ, and we have deferred the payment of taxes by many months so that we can help the businesses cope. However, we have not really touched or brought down expenditure much. 
uh, it is still a high of 21.7%. Uh, we did save a little bit. Uh, the result here is our deficit from 3.4% of GDP has gone up to 8.1% of GDP. In fact, the highest in our history, post-war history. And that means our debt is uh, increasing from 39 to 49.8%. So while you see deterioration in the numbers, we have to put this in the proper context of 10 or 20 years ago, where when our debt to GDP was closer to 80% in the 70s, we are actually in a very good position now to take advantage of the good credit rating to borrow and use it wisely. So that is where we are today. We also conducted several surveys. And uh, what we saw here are the following. Uh, in the consumer survey where 389,000 people responded, we found out that 44% uh, say that income is not enough. 44% of non-government workers lost their job. And the top three things that the consumers want are access to food, more efficient health system, and transportation. And these are actually what we are prioritizing in Bayanihan 1. We also asked several thousands of micro, small, and medium enterprises. And uh, what they say is that um, the 44,000 plus uh, businesses, 87.2% uh, or uh, have experienced uh, losses equivalent to 767 billion, 66% uh, had zero sales, and 33% had decreased sales. Uh, there are an estimate of 2.2 million workers that have not been uh, able to work and therefore have no pay, and that is why we are providing the small business wage subsidy. Uh, 33,000 of the 44,000 firms actually um, closed temporarily. And when we asked them what they needed, they asked for deferment of payments, they asked for tax discounts, and they also asked for low interest loans. So all of these actually are what we are doing under the Bayanihan one to be as responsive as possible to the uh, businesses. Finally, we also interviewed uh, 6,863 farmers. Fortunately, 65% were able to sell and 35% were not able to sell because of various uh, inspections or roadblocks or quarantine. 86% uh, continue to farm and they would like to get support uh, in terms of cash assistance, production support, and machinery support. Now, uh, because of the uh, situation in the economy and our survey, we have proposed a phased and adaptive approach for the recovery program. And to recap, it is comprised of three stages. The emergency stage where we are now, we are preparing the recovery stage, and I hope with your support, we can convince Congress of the best balance uh, while being responsible fiscally. And we are also preparing the resiliency stage or how we will cope with the new normal. And let me propose to you, uh, let me share with you what we are proposing to Congress. We are proposing three instruments. Each of them will be one bill. The first is on spending and capital support, which will be the Bayanihan 2 or the part continuation. The second is uh, to give firms, especially the small ones, tax incentives, and we call that CREATE. And the third one is to prepare the 2021 General Appropriations Act uh, so that we can respond to the virus better. Um, on the spending and capital support, the priority really here is to restore income and jobs of consumers. And we can do this from the demand side by stimulating, number one, the health system capacity and infrastructure. If we know and are confident that we will be safe and will not get sick, then we will go out, work, and get, an, get our income and buy goods and services. Uh, number two, uh, we will prioritize the food value chain from agriculture to food manufacturing, logistics, and food trade. And number three, we will restart the most impactful build, build, build project. So the whole idea here is first to restore confidence so that we feel that we will not get sick. We restore the most basic need of the people, which is food, 
and we will provide as many jobs by stimulating the healthcare system, the food value chain, and our priority infrastructure program, provided that all of them adhere to the minimum health standard. After we have done this, we will also support the firms. Uh, if, if the firms are not going to see more customers, then it is not useful to provide liquidity to them because even if you give them money, if no one will buy their goods or services, uh, parang sinayang lang natin yung support. So we have to do both supply and demand side. But assuming we can uh, recover in the demand side and boost and give back confidence to the people and their purchasing power is restored, then we are in a position to help the firms. And we will do this by using the financial sector to provide liquidity to prevent insolvency. So liquidity is uh, the need for cash today. Uh, we don't want a case wherein illiquid firms eventually become insolvent, meaning they don't even have enough assets to pay their liabilities. And for the micro firms, we will ask microfinance, the co-op banks, rural banks, and the thrift banks to continue to lend them. And we will use our government banks uh, to act as wholesalers to buy some of their loans so that they can be freed up of more capital to lend and help the small businesses. For the, mic for the small and medium enterprises, we will use credit guarantee through fill guarantee and continue some wage subsidy to provide support and for the large firms who are in need of support, and we have to be very targeted in this, we will provide equity support to match the bank lending. But we, of course, want the firms, the large firms, to be responsible and not waste the effort or the money from taxpayers. So that is the uh, thinking that we have to support firms. And for tax incentives, uh, we are proposing, and this is the first time the Department of Finance I was told, is proposing to reduce taxes across the board. So currently from the 30% corporate income tax, we will reduce it immediately to 25% to help small businesses in particular. We will enhance net operating loss carryover from three to five years. So your losses today can be credited to the future and effectively lower your tax payments. For new investors, we will actively seek them out and ask them what they would need as incentives to contribute to job creation in the Philippines. For existing investors, we will not change anything in the next four to nine years so that they can adjust because of COVID. For countryside, we will have targeted incentives so that we can support the Balik Provincia Bagong Pag-asa program. And finally, we will have to improve the management and governance of tax incentives through the FIRB or the Fiscal Incentives Review Board. So that when we do grant a tax incentive from the hard-earned taxes that your parents pay and that you will pay in the future, it will be performance-based, targeted, time-bound, and transparent. Uh, short of these, it's a waste of our uh, valuable tax uh, payments or contributions. And finally, we will use the 2021 GAA to prioritize health, build, 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 agriculture, food value chain, and all other new normal priorities. Um, let me now end by revisiting the five lessons, two of which I already explained to you, the economic lessons, and I will now uh, add three more for your consideration. And uh, you may want to memorize that, dream about it, or apply in your life. So again, the first one, nothing is free from heaven. We are helping the people, especially the poor people, but eventually, we will have to contribute in terms of the government being very transparent and accountable, the taxpayers, especially the richer ones, paying their fair share of the tax, and for the entire uh, country to help in this once-in-a-century crisis. The second is everything is a trade-off. Should we prioritize saving lives from the virus or saving lives from hunger? And that is the difficult decision that the government made when it imposed ECQ to buy us time to prepare our healthcare system so that we will prevent 100,000 deaths, which our models are showing. So those two are the important ones. So next time when you look at an economic issue or a policy issue about jobs or minimum wage or tax incentives or subsidies or ECQ, 
always remember these two economic, basic economic principles. And let me end by adding three more. The first is I invite you to know the fact, not to spread fake news or read from social media or listen to an opinion without doing the hard work of verifying the fact. Because knowing the fact and sharing the fact and studying it yourself is 10 times more uh, helpful in addressing the problem that we have today rather than uh, being emotional and sharing something you saw for the first time and you don't even know who shared it. The second is I invite you to contribute solutions and focus on the how to do it uh, question. Uh, many people have brilliant ideas. They read from their textbook in college and they read textbooks from the US and, they, and those textbooks say that during a crisis you should do A, B, and C. And they tell the government that you should do A, B, and C. But the same government officials also studied those textbooks and know what to do. We need to do wage subsidy. We need to help the poor. We need to uh, stimulate the economy. But the key question is, how do we do it? How do we translate a first best idea into a second or third or fourth best implementation uh, when our institutions, when our country is not first best? And therefore, uh, we have to adjust and, uh, and make it happen with the limited resources that we have. And one of the best way, I think, to contribute solutions is to join government or consider joining government because that will give you credibility to complain after you have helped and provided a solution. And finally, let me uh, ask you uh, to consider sharing also the good news. Uh, our society is basically driven by this practice. When there's a bad experience, 90% of the time we complain. If there's a good experience, 10% of the time we, uh, we say thank you, and 90% of the time we say nothing. Uh, it's the same in government. It's the same when you go to the restaurant. If you are served a bad food, 90% of the time you will complain. If you are, you, you are served a good food, 90% of the time, you do not say anything. What happens is, is uh, people hear only the bad and forget the good. So the idea here is for us to be very objective, contribute even how young we are, in ensuring that we work together constructively to find a solution to this once in a century problem. So to summarize, uh, please try to memorize this. If you can, dream about it and I hope you apply them in your lives. So with that, thank you very much.